Okay, my name is Sam, to remind you, S-A-M. And today we're going to discuss the transition from childhood to adolescence. Now, very, very long time, until more or less the 1960s, we believed in psychology that adolescents are simply bigger children. They are bigger body-wise, they are bigger in other ways, and they are not only bigger children, but they are crazy children. This was called the storm and stress model, that adolescents are crazy. They're doing crazy things, they cannot control their impulses, they have temper tantrums, they don't control their emotions, they're emotionally dysregulated. So it was a very negative view of adolescence. Take into account that the word adolescent was invented in 1906 by Stanley Hall. So before 1906, there was no concept of teenager. There was no concept of adolescent. You were born and you immediately became full-fledged human being. And when you were six years old, you were a little man or a little woman. There was no concept of child. There was no concept of adolescent. These are very, very, very new concepts. And as you remember, those of you who do, <laughs> from the previous lectures, lecture, this raises the issue. Are these concepts valid? They're very new. For example, we know almost nothing about adolescence. Almost nothing, because it's such a new field. Only recently, only in the last five years or six years, we, studied, we began to study the brain of the adolescent, adolescent brain. Probably because we assumed that adolescents don't have brains until five or six years ago. But now we discovered that most of them do. So we studied the adolescent brain. That's six years ago. So as you see, it's a very, very new field. And we as psychologists, as professionals, we are not quite sure of what we are saying. <laughs> One year we think that way, the next year we think in a different way, and our interactions with adolescents are not grounded yet. In other words, we talk a lot to adult people, we talk a lot to crazy people, of course, and we talk a, we talk a lot to children. So child psychology is very developed. But professionals, practitioners, clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, they're a bit afraid of adolescents because adoles they perceive adolescents as aggressive, unpredictable, so they avoid adolescence. So there's not much that we know. However, I'm going to introduce you to two, two models. This will be the beginning of the lecture, and then we'll go deeper into something known as social cognitive theory. Now, don't be alarmed. We're going to discuss Ericsson, and we're going to discuss Piaget in our future lectures. The reason I'm not starting with Ericsson and Piaget is that Piaget, Piaget's work has been largely, largely disproven. We now know that Piaget made many wrong assumptions and most of his work is unfortunately <laughs> not true. And so we leave him to the end. Ericsson was a brilliant um, psychologist although as I told you last time, he was not exactly a psychologist, but never mind. Ericsson was a brilliant something, and he came up with this, these stages of human life, which we are still using nowadays. But again, there is no scientific validity to Ericsson. So Ericsson, Piaget, Vygotsky, Freud, all these dudes, they are not scientists. They are like literature. They're like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy or, you know, they're, they're literature. They're not, not scientists because there are, there, there are no scientific experiments and studies that support their, their work. We have no way of testing many of what they are saying. We don't have a way of test to test. When you cannot test something, it's not science. So that's why I'm leaving these, these guys to the end. Um, and I'm reminding you that you can find as much insight and enlightenment and education in the work of Jambazov as you can find in the work of Sigmund Freud. So 
literature is a great introduction to psychology. Today we're going to discuss, we're going to start, and throughout this course, we're going to focus on theories of development, theories of development, which are much more scientific than theories of development, which are much more literary, like literature. Okay? Why is a theory scientific? It's scientific because it, it yields predictions. There's a theory, and the theory gives us predictions. And then we can test these predictions with experiments or with studies. And then we can see if the prediction is right or wrong. If the prediction is wrong, the theory is falsifiable. So we know the theory is false. If prediction is right, it doesn't say the theory is right, because we need to continue to test. But it's a good sign. Freud's theory, for example, cannot be tested. There's no way to design a test or a study or an experiment which will prove or disprove Freud. Same, same for Piaget. Why? Because Freud, Piaget, Vygotsky, and many others, they discuss what's happening inside the brain or the mind of a child. What's happening inside the brain or the mind of an adolescent. And we have no way to prove this or to disprove this. <laughs> we have to rely on what the child is saying, what the adolescent is saying. And that is not science, of course. Okay, let's start with uh, two theories. These are not the theories we're going to study today. Today we are going to focus on Bandura. Remember Bandura? I mentioned him last time. I um, gave you the very important piece of information that Bandura in many languages means tomato. But you should not hold it against him. He was still a very... Uh, important scholar. Okay, this is theory number one. It was created by a guy called Elkind. Elkind, see his name here. And Elkind, Elkind created this, this part. This part is not Elkind. This part is Elkind. <laughs> this part is observations. Piaget, Freud, others. So this part is history, and this part is Elkind. What are the differences between child and adolescent? When a child is born, think of a baby. Think of a baby for a minute. What does a baby do? What do babies do? do you don't know what babies do? You have never seen a baby? They cry. They cry. Yeah. Why do they cry? Because they want attention. Well, yes, they want attention. Do we know what is the attention for? Do we know what the baby wants exactly? We don't know. The baby can be hungry. The baby can be wet. Maybe the baby wants to change the diapers <laughs> to dry diapers. Maybe there's too much light. Maybe there's not enough air. Maybe he voted for the wrong political party. There are many options why babies cry. So, the baby, the, the internal world of the baby is, no one sees me. No one sees me. I'm not getting attention. I must get attention now. No one sees me. And so this is called cueing. This behavior is called cueing. Cueing. Oops. Because the baby is sending cues. By the way, not only, not only crying, not only crying, crying is very important, of course. Crying is the main communication of the baby. But babies do other things to attract attention. Give me another thing that babies do to attract attention. Can you think of something babies do to attract attention, except crying all the time? They throw things. They throw things? That's bigger baby. <laughs> yeah. When the baby is capable of throwing things, they throw things. That's about two years old. But a baby who is six months old, what do they do? They smile. They smile. And when mommy comes to the baby, the baby smiles at her. This smile is a cue. It's exactly like crying. It's a message. It's a signal. Mommy, I need you. Not mommy, I miss you. There's no love here. Contrary to what you see on on television, there's no love here. It's a need, it's a basic need. 
I need food, I need warmth, I need to be dry, I need you. <laughs> Come here, servant, change my diapers, you know, or you're fired. So, the baby cues the mother. If you want, you can sit next to Lydia and she will help you. Okay? You bought coffee and not for me? Ah, not for me. Okay, thank you. No, no, no. You got another one? Where? Da, da, da. Forget it. Okay. So this is the, the child. The child's main concern is no one sees me. I must attract attention now. You know? The adolescent is exactly the opposite. The adolescent thinks that everyone is noticing them. If they have pimples, if they have pimples or acne, they think everyone is noticing the acne. You know? If they are fat, they think everyone is laughing at them, that they are fat. So whereas the baby's basic thinking is no one is noticing me, the adolescent's basic thinking is everyone is noticing me. Elkind called it the imaginary audience. Imaginary audience. The adolescent has an imaginary audience. It's like the adolescent is all the time on a stage. Adolescent is all the time on a stage and there is this huge audience and the audience is watching him or her all the time. And whenever the adolescent does something wrong or is ugly or said something stupid, everyone is there to notice to mock him, to laugh at her, to humiliate. The, and this became much worse with social media. Social media amplified it, made it much worse than it used to be. So imaginary audience, what happened with social media, the imaginary audience became real audience. That's, and this is why adolescents nowadays are much more depressed and much more anxious than 40 years ago. The rate of depression among adolescents is up five times. It's five times higher than 1980. And the rate of anxiety among adolescents is three times higher. Why? Because they have a real audience in social media. These are studies by Twenge and Campbell. If you want to read more, Twenge and Campbell said that the smartphone the smartphone created depression and anxiety among adolescents. Twenge. If Elkind, if Elkind had created his theory nowadays, he would not have used the word imaginary. He would have used the word audience. Because every teenager nowadays has an audience, and a real audience. So this is no longer valid, actually. But Elkin created his work in 1976, which was long before social media. This is also known as referential ideation. See this? Referential ideation. Ideas of reference. What is referential ideation? Imagine that you enter a room. There's a room with many, many people. And they're all talking and laughing and eating from the buffet, and there's a big mess, and then you enter the room, and there's so many people around, yeah? And suddenly, when you enter the room, a group of people uh, start to laugh. So if you think this, they are laughing at me, they are laughing at me because I just entered the room and they just started laughing, so they're laughing at me. This is called referential ideation. It's the belief that everything is about you. If people are laughing, they're laughing at you. If people are gossiping, they're gossiping about you. If people are angry, they're angry at you, etc., etc. Another concept you need to learn, so referential ideation, yes? It, referential ideation is also known as ideas of reference. Another concept you need to learn is autoplastic
versus alloplastic. Autoplastic is when you blame yourself, when you say something is wrong with me. Something's wrong with me. I'm ugly, I'm stupid, I'm, you know, something's wrong with me. I made a mistake, I'm, uh, I misbehaved, I should not have done this. So you accuse, you blame yourself. This is autoplastic. Alloplastic is when you blame other people. When you say other people are bad, other people are evil, other people are guilty, I didn't do anything wrong, I'm okay, I'm a victim. I'm, so this is alloplastic defense. Autoplastic versus alloplastic. Teenagers, teenagers transition between autoplastic and alloplastic, and then again autoplastic, and then again alloplastic. They, they are not sure. They have no center. So sometimes they say, it's my fault. I did something wrong. And then they say, but actually I didn't do anything wrong. It's their fault. And then they say, but coming to think of it, maybe I did do something wrong. And they, they're like pendulum. They go from autoplastic to alloplastic to autoplastic and they can never find the center. They can never create the true picture. They can never have a nuanced um, view of reality and the world. So we will discuss it when we discuss adolescence a bit later, I mean, in, in the next lectures. So this is one thing you need to, a couple of uh, concepts you need to learn. And the other, couple of, hello, the other couple of concepts is ego dystonic versus ego syntonic. Ego syntonic is when you feel good with yourself. You feel good with yourself, you feel comfortable, you feel you're doing the right thing, you feel you accomplish or achieve results, you feel that people love you or like you, so you're ego syntonic. Feel good. Ego syntonic is I feel good. <laughs> ego dystonic is when you don't feel good with yourself. You're not comfortable in your own skin. You all the time doubt yourself, criticize yourself, put yourself down, mock yourself, and so on. So you're ego dystonic. Okay? These are, I'm introducing you to the language because we're going to use it later in the course. So, let's summarize the first difference. First difference, baby and child, no one sees me. I must attract attention. I must attract attention now. That's baby and child. Adolescent, everyone is watching me. Everyone is watching me. Everyone is criticizing me. Everyone is analyzing me. I'm such a failure. I'm so ugly. I'm so stupid. I'm so, this is exact opposite of the baby. Exact opposite of the child. Sometimes, adolescents, because of this, because of referential ideation, adolescents become very shy, very avoidant. They try to avoid other people or other adolescents, other teenagers. They, they isolate themselves. This is a reaction to referential ideation. They become egodystonic and they withdraw and they avoid. This process is called constriction. Okay, next. Baby and child are passive. The baby just lies on his back because most babies cannot walk immediately when they are born. So they lie on the back and they just wait. They wait for mommy to give them food. They wait for someone to change their diapers. They wait to be noticed. So babies are passive. And babies operate according to the principle of action, reaction. So mommy does something and the baby reacts. So Action, reaction, and passivity. Babies are recipients. Things happen to children. Uh, children rarely initiate anything. Things happen to them. And this is also known as helplessness. Helplessness. Children are helpless. They have no agency. Children have no agency. They are helpless. Everything is happening to them 
and there is nothing they can do about it. Okay? In adolescence, this is not the picture. Adolescents develop cognition, cognitive processes, and they use cognition to impact other people, the environment, the world, and reality. Adolescents are active agents. So, children are passive, and they are not agents. They are non-agentic. Adolescents are active, and they are agentic. They have agency. They act on the environment, and they change it using cognition, which is the topic of today's lecture. We'll come to it. Next. The child says, I am inside someone else's story. My mother has a story, and I am inside this story. I am just an element in my mother's story, my father's story, my grandmother's story. Later on, my peer's story, my teacher's story. I am, I am passively inside someone else's story. And I'm just an element in the story. This is the attitude of children. The attitude of the adolescent is exactly the opposite. It is my story, and everyone else is in my story. <laughs> so there is egocentrism. This is known as adolescent egocentrism. The adolescent says, the only story that matters, the only story that is important is my story. You know? And all of you are in my story. You're actors in my theater production. You're actresses in my movie. This is my movie. I'm the director, I'm the superstar of the movie, and you just happen to be there. So the baby or the child participates in someone else's movie, the adolescent in, the, in adolescence, everyone participates in the, in the teenager's movie. The movie belongs to the teenager. And this is known in Elkin's, in Elkin's work, this is known as personal fable, the personal fable, also known previously as fantasy. It's a fantasy, of course. When you say, this is my story, and all of you are in my story, what you are saying is, if I eliminate the story, if I stop the story, you will all disappear. <laughs> yes, if you're inside my story, and I finish the story, you're gone. If, I, if you're in my movie, and I stop shooting the movie, you disappear. But of course, that's nonsense. That is nonsense. So it's a fantasy. If we put all of these together, this is known as narcissism. Adolescents are narcissistic. Some people remain stuck. They remain stuck in adolescence. They see the world this way until they die. They see the world this way. They think that um, everyone is paying attention to them. They think that everyone is an actor or actress in their movie. They think, you know, they think this way when they're 50, 60, 70. So they are narcissists. These are the people known as narcissists. They remain stuck at this stage. For those of you who want to learn more about this process of getting stuck in adolescence and not being able to proceed, you can go online and look for this. Puer aeternus. Puer aeternus. This is the clinical term when someone gets stuck in adolescence and cannot become an adult. Okay, so this is Elkind on the differences between children and adolescents. When you look at this, the most important component, the most important element, the element we're going to discuss today is cognition. Because this is crazy. To believe that everyone is inside your story, this is fantasy. So this is, you know, cuckoo. When you grow up, when you exit adolescence, one of the first thing you, things you do, you get rid of this. And you understand that every human being has a story. And that we are in each other's stories. 
There's no single story that is the most important. There is no privileged story. So we get rid of this when we grow up, and we get rid of this. Everybody notices me. I'm the center of attention. I'm, we get rid of this. We realize that no one cares. No one cares about you. No one pays attention. Who cares about you? Everyone has their own problems, their own troubles, their own life. I mean, people don't care about you. So when we realize this, this is gone. And this is gone. What is never gone, what is never gone throughout life is your cognition. And this is the focus of today's lecture. But before we go there, I want to discuss this. Uh, remind me of your name? Uh, Ellen. Ellen. Okay. Who is missing? There was a sixth one. Uh, Michaela. Michaela is missing? She won't come. Huh? She, won't come. she wanted to come? Uh, she won't. She won't come. Okay. Because I, I have to fulfill attendance yeah. of students and so on. Oh, she did? Oh, I didn't receive it. I did not receive it. So this is the second model, and that is Kohlberg's morality. What is morality? If we have to summarize morality in one sentence, by the way, Jovan, feel free to participate. <laughs> if we have to summarize morality in one sentence, which sentence would you choose? Summarize for me what is to be moral. What is to be ethical? A single sentence. Okay. Hmm? You can also participate. Feel free. Even Marian can participate. <laughs> you have to speak up, I'm afraid. If you have to define it in a single sentence. You want to think about it? Think about it, and when you're ready, let me know. I will suggest to you something, and you tell me if you accept it. I think morality is about not harming other people. As simple as that. Not harming other people. You can do anything you want, you can do, you know, but do not harm other people. Do no harm, I think, is the basic principle of morality. There is another way of saying it. Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. Treat other people the way you want other people to treat you. And because you don't want anyone to harm you, then you don't harm other people. Google has a slogan, do no harm. You go to Google, Google's motto is do no harm. And I think that's the essence of morality. But there are many reasons to do no harm. For example, um, maybe you are afraid. Maybe you do no harm because you're afraid the police will catch you and you will end up in prison. It's a good reason to do no harm, right? <laughs> maybe you do no harm because you empathize, you feel bad for the other person. I mean, what I'm saying is the behavior is the same, but we don't know what's behind the behavior. What is the motivation? What is the attitude? So, Kohlberg said that children go through three stages. I mean, children, adolescents, and adults go through, th human beings go through three stages. Most adolescents are human beings, by the way. They go through three stages. One, pre-conventional. Pre-conventional means I'm going to behave myself. I'm not going to harm other people because if I harm other people, I will be punished. So it's a very primitive thing. I'm not going to harm other people because I'm afraid of the, of the outcomes. I'm afraid of the consequences. If there are no consequences, I will harm other people. It would be a pleasure. So this is what children think. And this is called the pre-conventional phase. What other group in the population think this way? I'm not going to harm other people because I'll be punished, but if I, there is a guarantee that I will not be caught and I will not be punished, I will harm other people. What other group behave this way? We know that children, very young children, behave this way. What other group behaves this way? 
Come on, think about it. What other group in the population among people behave this way? They are afraid of being punished, and if there is a guarantee they will not be punished, they will do something bad. They have a name. You can't even guess? No? Criminals. Yes? Criminals are afraid of punishment, and the fact that there is punishment prevents a lot of crime. But when they think they can get away with it, they will commit a crime. Okay, I'll give you a second chance, because I'm very, in a very good and generous mood today, so I'll give you a second chance. What other group in the population behave this way? Not criminals. I mean, some of them become criminals. Some of them become criminals. But what other group in the population, some of them criminals, some of them not criminals, behave this way? Hmm? I, they would be shocked to hear, to hear that. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good point. Some religious people are afraid of God's punishment, and if they think God, they can get away with it, they will misbehave. But I'm talking about people um, who are whose life is like that, whose personality is like that. It doesn't depend on an outside factor like religion. Yes? Sorry? Sinners is a religious term for psychopaths. Psychopaths are like this. A psychopath, you know what is a psychopath? All right. Psychopaths are people who behave in a way that avoids punishment, even if it means harming other people. In short, what I'm trying to tell you is that Kohlberg was wrong. He was wrong when he said that the pre-conventional phase is typical only of children. He was wrong about that. There are quite a few adults who are stuck in the pre-conventional phase of morality. They are afraid of punishment, but if they think they can get away with it, they will not be punished, they commit crimes and sins and they hurt people and, and so on. So, and by the way, this is not a small number. Do you know how many prisoners there are in the United States of America as we speak this very minute? Can you guess the number? Which is, is good, but not in a science class. You need to come with a number. Guys, wake up. In my class, you, you are participants, like me. You don't just, don't just listen, you also talk. So, give me a number, any number. How many prisoners do you think there are in the United States? Only in the United States. Hmm? Millions. Millions? Billions. Billions is an impossibility. The whole United States is 330 million. But of 330 million people, how, how many do you think are in prison? Give me a number. I will not do anything to you. Huh? No, not thousand, much more. Sorry? One million? Three and a half million people. Three and a half million people are in prison in the United States. So it's not a small group. The adults, the adults, who are stuck at the pre-conventional phase of morality, this is not a small group. Next is the conventional stage. We are talking about Kohlberg, you remember? Kohlberg and the development of morality between childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Conventional phase. The conventional phase is when you behave morally because someone told you to behave morally. So your father told you you should behave morally. Your mother told you you should behave morally. The government told you you should behave morally. <laughs> that would be funny. The police told you you should behave morally. Someone told you to behave, uh, religion told you to behave morally. So someone, some authority told you to behave morally. So you obey, you obey the authority. And this is known as the conventional phase. According to Kohlberg, the conventional phase is typical of adolescence. Adolescents follow, they imitate, they imitate sources of moral authority. There's a source of moral authority like religion, God, or like 
the state or like some philosopher or like, and they follow this. They behave morally because they are imitating. Adolescent see, adolescent does what adolescent sees. Yeah, so they imitate. Again, Kohlberg was wrong when he said that each stage, stage of morality belongs to each stage of life. He was wrong. For example, conventional morality exists among religious people, adult religious people, as Marian said. There are many religious people, and they are very moral, and they commit no sins, and they make no crimes, and they're very nice people, because they just follow the instructions of the church. That's it. So they are stuck in the conventional phase of morality, and they are not adolescents. <laughs> they're 40 years old and 50 years old, and they're no longer adolescents. The last stage is post-conventional stage. It's a stage where you decide what is moral and what is not moral. For example, imagine that there were a new law. A new law, yes, a law is an instruction on how to behave. Laws are supposed to be moral. Yeah? Imagine that there's a new law that we should put a specific group of people in prison just because of who they are. We should put them in prison because of who they are. Would you collaborate with such a law? For example, would you call the police and say, there's this guy and he belongs to this group, he should be in prison? Would you do that? Why not? There's a law. Why don't you obey the law? If I told you all, all homosexuals, all gay people should be in prison, and you have a gay neighbor, would you call the police and say, my neighbor is gay, you should come and take him and put him in prison? Why? There is a law. And even some religions say that homosexuality is a sin. So why wouldn't you do that? Religion justifies you, the state justifies you, everyone justifies you, maybe some of your neighbors would justify you also. They would say homosexuals are, you know, bad people and so on. Why wouldn't you do that? You said no. Why? Why wouldn't you do that? I don't know. I don't care, actually. If he or she is gay or not. So what you're saying is you don't think it's right to put him in prison? You don't think it's right? No. Would you? Would you tell the police to come and pick this guy up? Why? Why would you feel bad? Because you think it's not right. It's not right to do that. So this is the post-conventional phase. The post-conventional phase of morality is when you have your own your own compass, your own judgment. And you say, yeah, there's a law, but I don't think this law is right. Yeah, religion says this, but I don't think religion is right about this. Yeah, the politicians say it, I don't think they're right. My father says it, I don't think he's right. My mother says it, I don't think so. This ability to say, I don't think it's right, this is the post-conventional phase. But many, many people are stuck here and some people are stuck here, and they never, they never make it to the post-conventional phase. They just follow. They're like, you know, horses with blind. They just follow the crowd. They follow the herd. They follow the... And they don't think for themselves. They have no critical thinking. Okay? So, let's discuss the topic of today's lecture, which is... Just a second. Let's discuss the topic of today's lecture, which is cognition. Hmm? 
bez obrazen, nekulturen, katastrofa nevidena, debeliot profesor. Ok. Tell me, are you going to remember this moment? Are you going to remember that I suddenly sat down and ate, took out the chocolate and began to eat? Is this moment memorable? Do you, are you, do you think you're going to remember it more than what I say? Let's say. Do you find this moment strange? It's strange, no, that a professor suddenly takes out uh, chocolate and eats it. So I wish I could continue. So, why do you find it strange? Why is it strange? Because it's rare when someone... Sorry? Uh, it's rare when someone eats chocolate in class. People, many people eat chocolate. Marian eats chocolates. I eat chocolate. <laughs> Many people eat chocolates. But in class. In class. In class. Did you ever see another professor eating chocolate in class? So, why do you say it's rare if you saw other professors eating chocolate in class? Because it's not obvious, like every day. Okay. Did you expect me to eat chocolate in class? Did you expect it? Did you say, today the professor is going to come and is going to eat chocolate in class? So, you did not expect me to do this. Did I surprise you? Were you surprised? Maybe, yes. You were surprised. Were you surprised? You were not surprised? <laughs> All your professors eat chocolate in class? <laughs> what? I didn't ask if you minded it. I asked if I, if I surprised you. You were not surprised. Were you surprised? When you say you were not surprised, it means this happens all the time. You're not surprised. Does this happen all the time? Then why you were not surprised if it doesn't happen all the time? I think that it's normal It's normal for a professor to eat chocolate in the beginning of a lecture. <laughs> you think? Okay. What if next lecture I come here in a bathing suit? Dinner? Bathing suit. Swimming trunks. I mean, after you throw up. What, what, what would you say then? Would you then be surprised? Sorry? I'm crazy even without bathing suit. But... <laughs> but but would you be surprised that I'm here with the babies? Would you be surprised? Would you be surprised? And you? You'd be surprised. But we're all people, so what's the problem? You said we're all people, so what's the problem? Sorry? I didn't ask if you see it as a big deal. I asked if you would be surprised. You wouldn't be surprised that the professor comes in a bathing suit? I'm sorry, but I don't believe you. I go to No, 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 bathing suit. I come in a bathing suit, ready to go to the sea, to the swimming pool. Would be surprised. So all of you would be surprised, yes? Maybe except Marian, he knows me. All of you would be, <laughs> all of you would be surprised. Why would you be surprised? Because you did not expect it. Right? So the first lesson is expectations. We are beginning now to discuss the differences between children and adolescents, between children and teenagers, how t children become teenagers. Okay, the first thing the first difference, big difference, between uh, children and adolescents is expectations. When you're a child, imagine that you're a baby. You were just born. What expectations do you have? A baby. 
You're lying in the crib. You cannot walk. You cry a lot. You do many other things which we cannot discuss in class. And what? Yeah, we're not going to details. What? What are your expectations? What do you expect as a baby? To get a food meal. Yeah, you expect food. You expect food, and a bit later, when you are begin to, beginning to be aware of your environment, you expect your diapers to be changed. Yeah, because you're, you're wet, you want to be dry. You want to be dry and fed. And then you want to be fed and dry. And then you want to be dry again and fed. Essentially, these are the only two expectations, until age two, actually. These are the only two expectations. But as an adolescent, you have hundreds of expectations. Hundreds. You expect me not to appear in the class in a bathing suit because this would be a major trauma. You expect your father and your mother to behave in certain ways. You expect, you expect all kinds of things. You expect policemen not to shoot you. You expect many, many things. If you were to make a list of your expectations, everything you expect, you will discover that you have hundreds, maybe thousands of expectations. So that's a major difference between child and adolescent the amount of expectations and how expectations relate to the world. What happens, what happens to the child when the expectations are not met? The child wants to be fed and mother doesn't feed the child. What happens then? Hmm? Baby cries. Why do you think a baby is crying? He is trying to make force mother or signal to mother that he wants food. But there's another reason. The baby is frustrated. There's frustration. He could be, yes, and he's also scared that mother will never come back. But it, when mother is there, so he's not scared, but she doesn't give him food, he's frustrated. So babies have three basic emotions. Three, maybe. They have like, I want, I want food, I want, I want. They have, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that mommy will go away, will never come back. And they have, I'm angry. I'm angry, I'm frustrated. So there are three basic emotions. Wish, will, will, I want something. I'm afraid of something. And I'm angry that I'm not getting what I want. How many emotions do you have? How many emotions do you think you have? Do you have only three? You actually have, last time we counted, you have about 180 emotions. Last time we counted. You're beginning to see that the connection between childhood and adolescence is not continuous. It's not like the child becomes an adolescent. There is a child and then something happens. Something happens. There's no smooth transition. It's not like the child develops and develops and develops. Oops, suddenly becomes adolescent. There is a child, and then the child disappears, and adolescent appears. There is discontinuity. And I will finish this round by telling you why. Why this? Why this discontinuity? Why this happens? First of all, it's a common mistake even among psychologists, to believe that adolescents are just big children, like they're big children, <laughs> but they're not. Adolescents have almost nothing in common with children, almost nothing, psychologically, neurologically, biologically, almost not a single thing in common is like two separate entities. What does, what what animal does it remind you of? An animal that is one thing and then another thing. And they have nothing in common. There is such an animal, actually a group of animals, big, big group of animals, that they are one thing and then they stop being this thing and they become something completely different. And there is no connection between the two. Butterflies, yes. Butterflies go through three stages. Lava, chrysalis, and butterfly. And if you look at the three stages, 
There's no connection whatsoever. None. They don't look the same. They don't feed the same. They don't have the same uh, proteins. They are, it's three different animals. To a very large degree, human beings are like that. Now I'll explain to you why, and I'll release you for a few minutes. The human brain, of course. The reason is the human brain. When the child is born, the human brain is about 40% developed. Only 40%. As I explained to you last time, the pregnancy continues outside the mother because the head is expanding. And <laughs> if the head is too big, it's difficult to exit. So the baby continues to develop outside the mother. And initially, the brain is only 40% finished. And then the baby eats a lot and cries a lot and so on, and the, and the brain continues to grow and grow and grow. And by the age of three years, the brain is 80% finished. And by the age of five years, the brain is 90% finished. But only, only when it comes to the size of the brain. Only the size. The brain of the child has nothing to do with the brain of the adolescent. These are two completely different brains. And I'll give you three examples to explain to you what I mean when I say that these are totally different brains. The brain of the baby looks like this. A baby and, uh, baby and up to age seven, eight. So the brain of people up to age seven, eight looks like this. This is hemisphere and this is hemisphere. And that's it. And within the hemisphere, there are parts. I'm not going into details. And these parts operate independently. So it's a big bloody mess. It's total chaos. There is a very thin bridge, very thin connection between the two parts. But this connection is not active. This connection is known as corpus callosum. It's not active. So this is the brain of the child. Essentially two people. Left hemisphere, right hemisphere. Very little connection between them. Each part in the left hemisphere, each part in the right hemisphere operates totally independently. Baby can be emotional one minute and not emotional the next because different parts of the brain are taking over and so on. It's a mess, big mess. Here is the brain of the adolescent. These are the two hemispheres. And there's a, a growing connection, finally a very strong connection between the two parts. And th through this connection, information passes from the left to the right and from the right to the left. So it's like a, a highway or like a communication channel. The baby doesn't have this, the child doesn't have this, the adolescent has this. So the brain of the adolescent is unitary, a single entity. The brain of the child is many, many independent parts. Next thing, in the adolescent brain, there are parts which are very developed and parts which are underdeveloped or not developed at all. The parts which are very, very developed are the parts that take care of emotions, emotionality. The limbic system, the amygdala in adolescents are very, very developed. So adolescents are capable of emotions. They are much less capable of many types of cognition. They are not good thinkers. They think they're good thinkers because adolescents are not narcissists. They think they're the best, the greatest ever, and so on. But actually, adolescents don't know how to think. Their thinking is very primitive. Especially, they don't know how to think about the consequences of their actions. Adolescents are almost unable to accurately predict the consequences of actions and then take this prediction into account in order to modify behavior. So adolescents take risks and they do crazy things because they don't predict correctly what might happen. And this is because in adolescent brain, most of the activity and the only parts which are fully developed are emotional. The cognitive parts 
and the executive parts a very, very, in a very, very primitive state. And they would take another 10 years to develop fully up to age 25. So this is the, this is the adolescent brain and this is the and now adult brain. Adult brain looks essentially like a heart. The two hemispheres are totally integrated, totally. The corpus callosum is built into the two hemispheres, so there's a single brain. All the information is shared everywhere. There, is, uh, there are areas that replicate the functions of other areas. This is known as redundancy. So if you take half the brain away, the other half will take over. So the brain is totally integrated. All the areas are fully developed and fully active. You can see that there is no connection between these three. In the, in the child's brain, the level of chemicals known as neurotransmitters, the level of chemicals is very, very, very low. For example, children have almost no dopamine. Do you know what is dopamine? Dopamine is the neurotransmitter of pleasure. We think that children experience a lot of pleasure. That is not true. Children have almost no dopamine. Adolescents produce a lot of dopamine. Actually, dopamine is the dominant neurotransmitter in adolescents, so adolescents are focused on pleasure. Pleasure addiction, so adolescents would seek sex, they would abuse substances because dopamine is connected to addiction and to pleasure. So, no dopamine, or little dopamine, a lot of dopamine, crazy amounts of dopamine, normal amounts of dopamine. Again, we see that there is no connection between the three. These are like three different brains, three different creatures, three different entities, three different animals. And so, remember that when we discuss the concept of transition from childhood to adolescence and from adolescence to adulthood, which is how most of the textbooks are constructed. When you take a textbook, they talk about transitions, phases, stages. From the neuroscientific point of view, as far as neuroscience is concerned, that is a lot of nonsense. There, there are no smooth transitions. By the way, if you ask any adolescent, if you ask any adolescent, we have an exemplar here, <laughs> they will tell you that they don't feel continuous. They feel like sudden transitions, eruptions. They feel, they feel discontinuous as far as the body is concerned. Body image, cognition, it's all very discontinuous. And they're not, they're not wrong. It is discontinuous. Okay, when you come back from, if you come back, then we will discuss uh, what's happening in your mind, what's happening in, in your brain, something known as cognitive processes. You remember that we were discussing your expectations about my behavior in class and my threat to wear a swimming suit to the next lecture which would have contradicted your expectations. How do we call a situation when there is A and there is B and there is a disagreement between A and B or B contradicts A or how do we call this? What's the name in psychology for such a thing when A and B don't sit well together? Can you think of a word? Nope. Conflict? You heard of conflict? So, conflicts. The more professional world, if you want to, if you want to appear or to sound more professional, then you will use dissonance. Dissonance is just a fancy word for conflict. When you say dissonance, you appear to be very educated and very impressive. So when you want to impress someone, say dissonance. Otherwise, you can just say conflict. Conflict is good because when there is conflict, for example, your memory is much better. That's why I asked you when I was eating the chocolate, are you going to remember this moment? 
you're going maybe to forget, you're maybe going to forget a lot of the things I say, which is good for you, but you're very likely to remember this conversation about chocolate and swimming suit and so on, because it created conflict. There was a conflict between expectations and behavior. Whenever there's conflict, your cognitive processes, your cognition is much better. And actually, if you want to help yourself to have a better memory, to think faster, and so on, you need to create conflicts. Now, most psychologists will tell you the exact opposite. They will tell you you need to be at peace, you need to be relaxed, you need to be... But that's not what psychology teaches us. Conflict helps cognitive processes. Okay. Before we proceed to discuss additional concepts, I want to introduce you to the work of a guy with the impossible name, <laughs> by the way, the vast majority, the vast majority of psychologists and psychiatrists, they have totally crazy names. And I think they went into psychology and psychiatry because they have these crazy names, yes? So this guy is no exception. His name is Bronfen Brenner. <laughs> now imagine if you have a name like Bronfen Brenner, wouldn't you want to become a psychologist to understand what's wrong with you? Of course you would. So Bronfen Brenner came up with a model to explain life to himself. And this model is possibly today the most influential model in lifespan development psychology, which is the topic of this course. Today we use this model as the prime model. So here is what this model says. This model says that we are like waves, waves in a pond. You know when you take a small, a small pebble or a small stone and you throw it into the water, you have concentric waves, yeah? You have a small wave, then a bigger wave, then a bigger wave. These are known as concentric, concentric waves. So, Bronfenbrenner's <laughs> model is a concentric theory. In other words, there are smaller influences, bigger influences, and bigger, and we'll discuss them in a minute. The name of this theory is bioecological systems theory. And it's actually pretty cool. It's a cool theory. It's a nice theory. Here's what he says. He says we are all born with B. What is B? Biology. We are all born with some biology. Biology is like the hardware. You're all born with hardware and you are born with some basic software, like operating system. But you're not born with any specific programs or any specific applications, you know, you're like a smartphone with no apps, just the... So, this is the biology. This used to be called, this circle, used to be called etholog ethological theory, ethological. Do you know what is ethology? Ethology is the study of the behavior of animals and politicians, animals. <laughs> it's a study of animals, how animals behave. This is known as ethology. Ethological theory is the theory of how animals behave and it was, it is the brainchild of a guy called Konrad Lorenz. Konrad Lorenz, as the name implies, was German. One day, Conrad Lorenz acquired geese. Geese is the plural of goose. Okay. He bought. He bought a few geese. He had a huge uh, zoo farm, and he was experimenting on animals there. He was testing them, watching them, observing them, cooking them, and so on. So he was this scientist who was into animal behavior. And one day, he bought a goose, a group of geese, a flock of geese. 
And they were male and female, so inevitably the female became pregnant. And um, they hatched the eggs and young geese came out. Because of some accident, mother goose was absent when the eggs hatched. That means mother goose was somewhere busy, I don't know, I don't know where she went, and the, and the, and the eggs hatched, and young geese came out. And the first thing the geese saw was Conrad Lawrence. And Conrad Lawrence, the scientist. So when the, when the tiny geese came out of the eggs, they saw Conrad Lawrence. They didn't see Mother Goose because Mother Goose was busy with Upra Vazerni Prihodi, so they saw Conrad Lawrence. And they started to follow Conrad Lawrence wherever he went. He went back home, they followed him, he went to the... So they were following him everywhere. Everywhere. Because they thought that Conrad Lawrence was Mother Goose. So Conrad Lawrence designed an experiment. He designed an experiment. He put all the small geese, the small geese that hatched when he was there, and the small geese that hatched later when Mother Goose was there. So he had many, many small geese. He put all of them under a box, under a box, and then he stood to the left, and Mother Goose stood to the right. It's a true experiment. And there were many tiny geese under the box. And again, some of them hatched when Lawrence was there, and some of them hatched when Mother Goose was there. So when he, when he remotely lifted the box, some of the geese, some of the tiny geese, went to Mother Goose, and some of the tiny geese went to Conrad Lawrence. Even though Mother Goose was there, the tiny geese that hatched with Conrad Lawrence regarded Conrad Lawrence as the mother. So this process is called imprinting. Imprinting. And so, in human babies, in human babies, the touch and the smell, touch and smell of the mother create imprinting. The human baby is imprinted with the touch and the smell of the mother, and a bit later, with the visuals, about four or five weeks old, the baby begins to see mother, to look at her face, and so he's imprinted with her visual. And he develops, the baby develops something called attachment. Attachment is not unique to human babies. Geese, the small geese, they got attached to Conrad Lawrence. But in human babies, attachment starts biologically, and then on top of the biology, there is social attachment. And this is a theory, it's called attachment theory, and this is a theory that was first described by Bowlby. It is known as attachment theory. So human babies start off like tiny geese, but then society intervenes, other people intervene, and human babies change from geese to human, and they develop human attachment. This is the microsystem. The microsystem is based on the biology, based on the baby's capacity to bond, to attach to other people. It's based on that. And the baby attaches to the first people he sees. Baby attaches to mother, to father, to grandmother, to grandfather, to other people who are constantly, regularly in the environment of the baby. And this becomes the micro system, micro system in proper pronunciation. Okay? Biological system, micro system. Slowly, gradually, the baby begins to interact with people in the microsystem. But these people in the microsystem, they are adults usually, or they are bigger, they are older than baby, older siblings, for example. So these people go to school and go out to the city and, and work 
they have workplaces, they have jobs. They, so these people are exposed to the outside world. Baby is here. That's baby. B could be biology, B could be baby. <laughs> baby is here. Baby is interacting with the family, but the family is interacting with the outside world. And the outside world is the mesosystem. The mesosystem is comprised of institutions. Can you give me an example of an institution? School is an institution, the most important one actually. Another institution. A hospital is an institution, although a hospital is rare, like most people don't usually end up in hospital. City hall. City hall. Yes, municipality, municipal services, government, government. Another example of an institution which affects the family, which affects the baby. So you see the power is coming from outside. The power is coming from here all the way to baby. And then baby develops. Baby develops from here all the way there. It's a two-way street. So religion, for example. Religion belongs in the mesosystem. Okay. So here is a happy family with a happy baby, a crying baby, and the family is interacting with the institutions, and the baby is growing up. As the baby is growing up, the baby begins to be exposed to institutions. You mentioned school. So gradually the baby transitions from microsystem to mesosystem. So baby goes this way. Maybe it goes this way. Okay, mesosystem is institutions. Then there is exosystem. The exosystem is the community. What is the community? Community is not necessarily your city, not necessarily your country. Community is the group of people with whom you share, you share the same values, the same history, the same economic activities, and I forgot to write here the same language usually. The same, so this is your community. And again, community doesn't have to be equal to nation or equal to city or, it's simply the group of people that constitute your environment. So baby goes to school, and within school, there will be a group of peers and they will hang out together, okay? These peers will hang out together. This would become the baby, the child's community. So this is already the exosystem, it's pretty advanced. We are talking ages six to nine, maybe more, and in adolescence. Exosystem, mesosystem and exosystem, especially exosystem, is very crucial in adolescence. Because what adolescents do, they create instant communities. Wherever the adolescent goes, adolescent tries to team up with peers. Actually, adolescents are much more influenced by peers and much more educated by peers, including sexual education, than by anyone else. Peers, the peers of the adolescent, the people who are in the same age group, they influence the adolescent and they teach the adolescent much more than any teacher, any professor, any, any mother and any father and any grandmother and any grandfather. They, peers are crucial in adolescence. Because peers are crucial and they are the reference point, the adolescent always measures himself against the peers. Am I like them? Am I not like them? Am I liked by them? Do they dislike me? Do they criticize me? Do they want me? Do they hate me? There's always this, remember, imaginary audience. So the adolescent always measures himself against the peer group and this creates a community, in effect. Adolescents are excellent at creating communities and when they fail, they isolate themselves completely. And actually, if an adolescent fails to create a community, this could have severe mental health consequences. Adolescents that are rejected socially, they fail to create a community. This kind of adolescents are anxious, depressed, and they have a pretty high suicide rate. 
So social rejection is life-threatening in adolescence. Not only in adolescence, by the way. Social rejection is life-threatening. So adolescents will do anything. If they cannot belong to this group, they will create their own group. If they are rejects <laughs> and freaks, then they will team up with other rejects and freaks, and they will create their own community. This is the EXO system. In between adolescence and early or young adulthood, we transition to the macro system. The macro system is the culture, the culture we're in. What is culture? Culture is a set of stories. Culture is a group of narratives. Culture, culture tells you this is right to do, this is wrong to do. Culture tells you this is how you should behave, this behavior is not acceptable. Culture, culture tells you this is our common history. Culture tells you all other people are bad, we are the only good group. <laughs> Culture tells you many, many things. Culture is a kind of in-group. We make a distinction between in-group and out-group. In-group is the group we belong to. Out-group is everyone else. And of course, our in-group is superior. We are the cleverest, we are the handsomest, we are the most amazing, we are. Or, we are victims. The out-group is evil and malicious and bad people. We are good people. We are victims. So, there's a narrative. The macro system is a series of stories. And it's very important to understand. Animals need food. Animals need food. We also need food from time to time. We, human beings, we need stories, not food. The thing that makes us human is stories, meaning. We need to find meaning. If we don't find meaning, if we don't make sense of the world, we'd rather die than we prefer to die. If the world doesn't make sense to us anymore, we want to die. We need to understand the world, and we need to write a story which explains the world to us and explains us to the world. So this is the stage, the macro system is a stage where we create a culturally conforming narrative, a narrative which would allow us to fit into society and into our culture. This is done, this process is done in two ways. Socialization, and acculturation. Socialization is when the child and then the adolescent is taught how to belong in society, how to behave in society, how to flirt with the other sex, how to, how to work with other people, how to collaborate, how to. How to. It's the period of how to. These guides, these manuals, user manuals, society's user manuals, they are called scripts. So, so socialization is about scripts. Acculturation is the same. Socialization is how to behave in society, how to fit in, how to be effective in society, how to collaborate, how to achieve outcomes in society. Acculturation is how to do the same in a culture. What's the difference between society and culture? A culture can include many societies. For example, Western culture. Western culture is the same in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in Israel. So it includes many societies. Culture is much more important than society. Much more important. That's why people emigrate. They live in one society, but they belong to the same culture. So they feel comfortable to move from Macedonia to Serbia or from Macedonia to Germany. It's the same culture. We are mobile within the same culture. Society is much less important, actually. So socialization and acculturation, we are being taught scripts. 
Can you give me an example of a script? Something that your father and your mother teach you about how to behave in society in a way that you will obtain results and you will be accepted. Can you give me an example? Based, of course, based, of course, on your biology, on your family, on your, because everything builds, builds on the foundation. There's a foundation, it's, it's, a, it's a tower. It's like a tower. So, can you give me an example of a script? To be kind to other people? Yeah. That's a behavioral social script. True. That's true. But a much more important fundamental script, which... Respect. respect is a behavioral script. But I'm talking about a script that defines you. That if I take away this script from you, you will not feel yourself. So, you can be kind, but you can also be unkind. So, there's no problem with it. You will still feel yourself. But there are, there are scripts. There are some scripts that if I take them away from you, you will not feel that you are the same. You will feel very strange, very bizarre. Don't spend more than you can earn. Don't spend more than you can earn? That's a behavioral script. But you can spend more than you can earn and you will still feel like Marian. Right? I want something that if I take it away, that I want, what is a script? It's a script is when I teach you how to behave. I'm telling you, you must behave this way. Okay telling you to behave this way. If I take it away from you, you will not feel the same person. You will feel like a different person. Okay, I will not torture you. Although it's a pleasure to torture you, but I will not torture you. <laughs> Gender, men and women. We are born, yes. Being alien, did you say? Yeah, belonging. Belonging is the outcome of, of socialization and acculturation. If you follow the scripts, you feel that you belong. We'll discuss belonging later. It's not a script, it's the outcome of a script. But men and women, we are all born with biology. Well, most of us are born with biology. This biology is male-female. In very rare cases, like in extremely rare cases, a baby is born with both genitalia, male genitalia and female. These babies are known as androgynous babies, but that's extremely rare. Vast majority of human beings are born with male or female organs. And this is known as sex determined on birth, at birth. Okay. But then you are taught how to be a man or a woman. You're taught. They teach you how to be men, and they teach you how to be women. There is no necessary connection between your biology and your gender role. That's why it's called a role. You're acting. This is called performative role. You're perform it's a performance. To be a woman is a performance. Obviously, you all have makeup. It's a performance. Makeup. Actors put makeup. Yeah? You're putting makeup. Um, so it's a performance and it's a role and you learn it. So if you as a, as a small child, you're two years old and you're, you're a girl, yeah, you're a girl. That means you have a specific set of biological genitalia, yeah. And as a girl at two years old, you climb on trees, you beat up all the boys and you, you like carpentry. You're very likely, people are very likely to tell you what kind of behavior is this? You're not like a girl at all. That's not how girls behave. And if you're a boy, you're two years old, three years old, and you cry, you cry because you're sad, you're very likely to be told, boys don't cry. So we are socialized into gender roles. It's an example of a script that if I take it away from you, you will no longer feel yourself. If I tell you, you're not a woman anymore, what are you? Not much is left. So this is a script that is all pervasive, a script that takes over. By the way, there are cultures and societies where people can choose to be male or female, um, men or woman, I'm sorry. Male and female is biology. Men or woman. 
And one of these cultures is very near here. In northern Albania, when there is a family and there are no male heirs, there are no men born, only females are born, one of the females can choose to become a man. So in northern Albania, according to the Kanun, by the way, a woman can choose to become a man. She declares that she is a man. She wears men's clothing. She goes to coffee houses and smokes in public, which is, you know. So she becomes a man. Everyone treats her as a man, and the law treats her as a man. From that moment on, throughout the rest of her life, she's a man. Because the family did not succeed to produce men, she became a man. And that is in northern Albania. That is not in the United States with transgenders and I don't know what. That is not far from here. So in many societies and cultures in Africa and so on, you are born as a male or a female, but you can choose to be a man or a woman. Absolutely. Um, and that's an example of a, of a script. The process of transition between systems, transition from this to this to this to this, up to the chrono, by the way, the chrono, the chrono system is the period in history that you were born into, your generation. If you look at me, I'm a boomer. I'm the boomer generation, the worst generation ever. And if you look at you, you are Z, I think, Z generation. So, we belong to different generations. We have different experiences, different values, different cars, I hope, different. So, we are different just by being born into a specific year and a specific generation. That's enough to define us in some ways. So, this is the chrono uh, system. So, in the transition from biology, geese, tiny geese, to the chrono system, which is a whole generation all over the world, you know. This, period, this transition through socialization and acculturation continues in most people, but not in all people. In most, but not in all. You realize this is a process. It's an evolution. Okay, the, key, the baby becomes child, the, child, the to, uh, infant, the infant becomes toddler, the toddler becomes child, the child becomes adolescent, and so on. It is not, it is not smooth, as I mentioned to you, it is jumps. By the way, there's a technical term for this. I love technical terms because it makes me look intelligent. The technical term is punctuated equilibrium. That means it's not smooth, but it's like that. So this is punctuated equilibrium. So these transitions happen to most people. Can you give me two cases where these transitions will be disrupted, will not happen? At some point or another, the person will get stuck. Can you give me two reasons for this to happen? Why would this happen? Why a child would not make these transitions. Why a child would get stuck? A child can get stuck. A child can get stuck here. A child can get stuck here, here. Any, at any stage, why would anyone get stuck? Can you think why? Sorry? Yeah, but why? Everyone is afraid of something new. I will, uh, this is a very interesting point. This is a very interesting point, I promise you. Uh, remind me of your name? Yeah. Yes. Phew. After age 60, there is something called cognitive decline. It's when you're beginning to lose your memory and you don't know where you are and who you are. So I'm 64, you can imagine. Okay. Juliana. I got it right, until next time. Juliana said that uh, there is a kind of fear, that fear inhibits the child. The child cannot, 
And this is a very correct observation, by the way. However, all children overcome the fear. And I will describe to you one moment of such terror, complete terror, that the child, all children overcome. They succeed to overcome. When the child is about 18 months old, the child is about 18 months old, the child begins to notice something very strange. The child begins to notice that mother is an external object. She's outside. The child begins to realize that he and mother are not the same, which is terrifying. We discussed it, I think, last time. And then the child begins to explore the outside, the external. The child begins to explore the world. And it's frightening because it's a two-year-old child, not even a two-year-old child, without a mother, taking on the entire world. It's pretty terrifying. So here's a moment of terror which the child overcomes. There's no greater terror than this. This is known as separation individuation. I mentioned it last time, Margaret Mahler. Fear is not the, the explanation. Okay, I will help you with one, one example, but on condition that you give me another one. Uh, what's happening here is called sadism. It's when someone likes to torture other people. Okay? And because there's nothing you can do about it, you know, you're my hostages. Right? I'll give you one example. Imagine that the child is born with a brain defect, with what we call a neurodevelopmental disorder, or a neurocognitive disorder. Can you give me one example of a neurodevelopmental disorder? Have you heard of neurodevelopmental disorders? Did you hear about autism? Yeah. Autism spectrum disorder? Autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It's a damage to the brain, one way or another. The brain is abnormal in structure and in function. Of course, such a child cannot develop normally and does not succeed to transition from one system to another. And autistic people, especially, extreme autism, they're totally cut off from the world, in effect. Even, aut people, people, even autists, people with autism, who are high-functioning, these are people with autism who can function in society, and they're very good at their job. For example, they're great computer programmers, mathematicians, and, and so on and so forth, professors of psychology. So even people with autism, with high-functioning high autism, they are not connected to the world. They cannot read, they cannot understand other people. They cannot read social cues, body language. They can't. They're inside their mind. So neurodevelopmental disorders and neurocognitive disorders disrupt the process. Can you give me another example of this? Why, why would, what would be something that disrupts the process of this transition, of this development, of this evolution into an adult? Because you're an adult only when you reach this point. This is where you become adult. You must go through all the... What could disrupt it? You start to develop and then boom, something and you're stuck and that's it, for life. So we said something in the brain. Have a look at the, have a look at the, at the systems. Biology, that's the brain. Okay. Next cycle is family. No, I'm giving you a hint. Don't be so afraid. You can be wrong. Process of learning is based on mistakes, not on getting it right, but on getting it wrong. So don't be so afraid to be wrong. I will not do anything to you, I think. We'll see. What? Very true. Poverty affects this. True. Family. Focus on the family. It's poor. What, what other options with the family? If the family is poor, the children don't have the opportunities to develop. By the way, it affects the brain. There are studies that show that in poor families, brain development in the children is much slower. That's a fact. In rich families, there is another problem. It's known as impulse control or inhibition. The children don't learn 
to socialize because they think they, they are entitled, They're, no one can tell them what to do. They, so in these types of families, I'll give you another example, a family where the mother or the father or both are abusive. They're physically abusive, psychologically abusive, verbally abusive. So these types of families, they're called dysfunctional families. And dysfunctional families can also arrest the development. It used to be called arrested development. They can arrest the development. So when the child begins to develop, boom, stuck. And the child doesn't thrive. Now there's a name for that. There was a big study, the biggest in history, by the way, of this arrested development, of cases where children cannot develop. And the outcomes, the consequences are lifelong. And they're not only psychological. For example, people who grow up in poor families, dysfunctional families, super rich families, and so on and so forth, later in life, they have a lot more heart attacks a lot earlier. So the body is affected also, lifelong. And this study, is the biggest in history, by the way. And this study is called ACE. ACE, Adverse Adverse Childhood Experiences, the ACE study. So today we know, and the ACE study included only 10, 10 elements of dysfunctional families, including divorce, for example. So today we know that the development of the child can be disrupted early, and this could have lifelong consequences, psychological and physical, body as well. And if it is very, very early, like if the, there is a disruption in development, in evolution, much earlier than 36 months, the child fails to develop a self. The child has no self, no, no core identity, no feeling of essence, no stability in terms of who the child is. The child doesn't know. When the, this child grows up, he doesn't know who he is. So this kind of child needs other people to tell him when he grows up, when he becomes adult. This kind of child needs other people to tell him who he is. So he, this kind of child, when he grows up, he goes to other people all the time and says, am I like that? Is this true? Okay. All the time he, he needs feedback from other people. And if he doesn't get this feedback, he feels that he does not exist. So the disruptions could be very serious. I have a puzzle for you, for a change. Why don't you remember anything from age one? Why? Do you remember what you did yesterday, more or less? <laughs> yeah? More or less? A year ago, more or less? Probably. Do you remember what you did when you were 10 months old? Do you have any memory from 10 months old? No. Why? Don't you think it's strange? Yes. I mean, you're born with a brain. Why don't you have? This is known as infantile amnesia. This is known as infantile amnesia. And there are two reasons for this. When you are very young, when you're one year old, two years old, and even three years old, you don't have a story, you don't have a narrative, and you don't have empathy. 
Let me explain. If I tell you, I give you now a list of words. Uh, fall, wet, fall, wet, rain, forest, me, go. Ten, ten minutes later, would you remember these words? Some of them. You remember some, but not all. But if I say, it was raining, I was wet, and I went to the forest, you're likely to remember it much more. Memory is function of narrative. To remember, we must have a story. It's not enough to expose you to numbers or to words. They must be connected. The interconnectedness of words and numbers, the narrative cohesion, is crucial for memory. There is very little memory where there is no story. Let me give you an example. Look. Okay. Which one has a narrative? It's the same numbers, number of uh, lines. Same number of lines, yes, there are six. Six there and six here. Which one has a narrative? Which one has a story? The first one has a story? What's the story of the first one? The second, you think? You have to explain why you... I mean, there are only two, so it's either the first or the second. You have to explain why. Why? Don't be afraid of me. Don't be afraid of me. I mean, I will punish you, but... Yeah. Tell me the narrative. Think that we are sitting in a... Kafana, and you're telling me a story. Tell me the story of the second. Why? What does the space say? Let me help you. It's a narrative. One plus two equals three. Yes, but this is definitely a narrative. It's much easier to remember. Is there anyone here who doesn't know that one plus two is three? No one, no one. All the students know, some of the teachers also. The, this is not a narrative. Now here's something interesting, which you noticed. Here's something interesting. The less order we have, the more chaos, the more narrative we have. Look, look again. This is very organized. Yes? This is very regular. There's a lot of order here. No? This is much more organized and orderly than this. But this has no meaning. This has meaning. The more disorder, the more chaos, the more we need a story to make sense, the more a story emerges. Where is there more chaos? When you're a baby or when you're adolescent? Where is more disorder? Where is more mess? When you're a baby or when you're adolescent? Adolescent. Adolescent, of course. When you're a baby, there's food, mommy, diapers. Diapers, mommy, food, food, mommy, diapers. There are how many combinations? Three, nine combinations. That's, that's the world of the baby. But when you are adolescent, it's a mess. You have millions of uh, configurations and so on. So, this is baby, and this is adolescent. Less order, more narrative, more story. More order, less meaning, less sense. Without meaning and without narrative and without sense, we 
we cannot have memory. That's why children don't have memory. They don't have a story. They don't have a narrative. They, are, they do have memory, like they have memory for, ten, for about an average of 20 seconds. The average memory of a baby under age six months is about 20 seconds. They do have this. By the way, adults have this also. When there is no narrative, adults remember things 10 to 20 seconds and then forget them when there is no narrative. So, first thing important is narrative. In the absence of narrative, baby doesn't remember anything. Infantile amnesia. Second thing is empathy. The big discovery of the 1960s was that we create who we are, we become who we are, by interacting with other people. Everything inside us, the unconscious, the conscious, behaviors, cognitions, emotions, you name it, everything inside us has to do with our interactions with other people. I, you remember I told you about the feral children, the children who were left in the woods, in the, in the jungle, you know, they didn't have it. So, in the absence of other people, there's no me. There's no me. There's no self. There's, no, there's nothing, no, no entity that can remember. If you don't have a self, who will do the memorizing? Who will, who will remember? If you don't have a self, you cannot remember. And if you don't have other people around you, you don't have a self. And if you don't have a self again, you cannot remember. The baby does not recognize the existence of other people externally and separately. He recognizes that other people exist and so on and so forth, but the interaction of the, of the child up to age more or less five years old, the interaction is extremely limited and is based on needs. I need something. I need food. I need to play. I need this toy. I need. So the baby is focused on itself, not on others. The baby does not recognize that other people exist in any meaningful way except as providers, service providers. And therefore, the baby doesn't have full-fledged empathy. It is through empathy that we connect to, uh, with other people, and it is by connecting to other people that we become who we are, and it is by becoming who we are, by having an identity that we can remember. Because you need, in order to remember, you need to be someone. Someone needs to do the remembering. By the way, it goes the other way also. If you don't have memories, you don't have identity. So it's two ways. If you don't have identity, you cannot remember. Who will do the remembering? If you don't have memories, you don't have identity. Can you give me an example of someone who has no memories and therefore has no identity? An example of a human being without memories and therefore this human being has no identity. Can you give me an example? Can you give me an example, Lydia Angeloska? Huh? Politicians. No, but I'm talking about human beings. Human beings. Let's talk about human beings. Who, who doesn't have a memory and therefore loses his identity or her identity? Have you heard of Alzheimer? Yeah. Alzheimer, dementia? The core feature of Alzheimer is a loss of memory. Consequently, these people in the extreme stages, in the last stages, terminal stages of Alzheimer and other dementias, these people have no identity. They don't know who they are. They don't recognize their husbands, their wives, their children. Their, they have no memory of what they've done, and so on and so forth. Alzheimer's and dementia are wonderful compared to another disease, a disease known as Korsakoff syndrome. Korsakoff syndrome Korsakoff syndrome is when you drink too much, like me, and ultimately, ultimately, this damages your brain. It destroys your brain completely. The alcohol destroys your brain completely, and you become a Korsakoff patient. 
Korsakoff patients have memory which is between 20 seconds and five minutes. They are unable to create long-term memories because their hippocampus is short, destroyed. So maximum they can remember five minutes. So when you meet a Korsakoff patient, you meet a Korsakoff patient, hello, my name is, I don't know what, and you shake hands, my name is Sam. What's your name? My name is Zoran. Okay, five minutes later, he would say, who are you? So I'm Sam. Ah, oh, uh, pleased to meet you, I'm Zoran. Five minutes later, who are you? I'm Sam, Zoran, and this continue forever. This is the Korsakoff uh, patient. When you ask the Korsakoff patient who they are, they don't know. However, Korsakoff patients maintain a kind of memory that is, that is known as working memory or semantic memory, and it's a memory of how to do things. So a Korsakoff patient can play the piano, for example, or work on a computer without any problem. We'll come to memory, we will discuss memory. It's a fascinating field, amazing field, which uh, demonstrates the brain's complexity. But you got the picture. The baby cannot connect to other people because the baby doesn't have empathy and the baby doesn't have a story. So consequently, no memory, infantile amnesia. Let's talk a bit about empathy, a bit more about empathy. It is such a pleasure to erase, much more than to write. <laughs> ah, erasing is fun. Erasing is fun. Yeah. Okay. Empathy. There are three types of empathy. Reflexive, cognitive, and emotional affective. Again, these levels of empathy represent developmental stages. This course is about human development through the lifespan. And as we're beginning to see, as we grow older, we have the same things, but they become different with time. So we start with reflexive empathy, and then it becomes emotional empathy. And there's no connection between reflexive empathy and emotional empathy. It's as if we become different human beings from stage to stage. It's an amazing process, similar to the butterfly. So, reflexive empathy. Reflexive empathy is when the baby sees mother smiling, mother smiles at the baby, and the baby smiles back. That's a reflex. The baby doesn't know that mother exists. Because baby, babies smile back 24 hours after they're born. Babies don't know that mother exists at this stage, 24 They can't even see, by the way. They cannot even see. <laughs> but she smiles, the baby smiles. That's a reflex. And this reflex is based on, on something called mirror neurons, which we'll not discuss here. A bit later in life, around the ages of two, three years old, the child develops cognitive empathy. So the baby will see mother smile and smile back. The child will see mother smiling and he will say, mother is happy. So there is a connect connecting of concepts to observed behaviors. Mother is smiling, she must be happy. Why? Because when I'm happy, I'm smiling. When I'm happy, I'm smiling. When other people are smiling, they're happy. This is cognitive. But there is no emotional reaction, especially around age two or a bit less. There's no emotional reaction. So such a child can see someone crying and not do anything. He will see someone crying and the child will say in his mind, she is crying, she is sad. But that's it. There will be no action. Why? Because this is missing. Emotional affective empathy. Emotional affective empathy is mother, is mother is crying, 
my, I think she said, because when I am sad, I'm crying. So I think she said, mother is crying, that is reflexive. I think she said, that is cognitive. I'm going to hug mommy. I'm going to hug mommy because I want to make her happy. That's emotional empathy. That's the latest stage, five, five years old, more or less. Again, people can get stuck. People can get stuck. For example, people diagnosed, people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder and with antisocial personality disorder, also known as psychopaths, these people do not have emotional empathy. They don't have this. These people get stuck and they have only reflexive and cognitive. I coined the phrase cold empathy, which is now used in the literature also. So cold empathy is reflexive plus cognitive, but without emotion. It is cold, it's not warm. Let me give you an example. Imagine that there are two guys, two guys in a bar, okay? They go to the bar, and there's a, a woman crying in the corner. And so one of the guys is a healthy, normal, nice, kind person. The other guy is, let's say, a psychopath, okay? A psychopath is someone who has only cold empathy, has no emotional empathy, is exploitative, is goal-oriented, and so on. So, there are these two guys, and there's a woman crying. The healthy guy would say, the healthy guy would say, she's crying. I know that when I'm sad, I'm crying, so she must be sad. And because she's sad, I will make her happy. So, he goes to her, asks, can I do anything for you? What's wrong? I want to talk about it, and so on. This is emotional empathy. The psychopath would say, uh, she's crying, that's reflexive. When I'm sad, I feel like crying, so she must be sad, that's cognitive. But then the psychopath would say, oh, I can steal money from her because she's distracted, she's crying, she doesn't notice, I can steal her, her purse. Or I can have sex with her, she's vulnerable, she says, I can have sex with her. So the psychopath, Will, will not transition into emotional empathy, but will immediately ask, what's in it for me? How can I benefit from it? You know? So there are groups of people who are stuck at this stage, and they don't have this. Okay? What we are doing in this uh, lecture, in this day, is I'm giving you all the parameters of development across life, so society, this, that, empathy, and so on, so that we can begin to discuss, next time, we can be begin to discuss specific theories of development because all these theories are using these concepts. They're using these words. If you are not acquainted with these concepts and words, you will not understand anything from these theories. Next. Next is uh, cathexis, attitude, motivation. So I'm now like introducing you to the dictionary, to the vocabulary, okay? Cathexis, attitude. Cathexis is emotional investment. Emotional investment, commitment to a specific type of action, a specific behavior. I'm emotionally invested in this project. I'm emotionally invested in teaching. I'm emotionally invested, invested in running away from the class the minute I can. You know, I'm, this is emotional investment. This is known as cathexis. Attitude is a set of beliefs about yourself and about the world. So for example, if you say, I'm, I'm pretty stupid, I'm a constant failure, you know, I'm not likely to succeed, then you will not try. 
If your attitude is self-defeating, then you will not even try. Attitude conditions motivation. Attitude is a condition, precondition for motivation. If, on the other hand, your attitude is, I'm a genius, I can do anything I want, I will always succeed, then, of course, your motivation will be very high. And motivation is the driving force, the driving force to act. That's generally speaking, we'll come to it when we discuss specific theories, we'll come to it a bit later. Okay, executive function. These are concepts that we're going to use later when we discuss specific theories. You remember, yes? So um, today is dictionary day, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's as boring as dictionary. Executive function. Executive function emerges only in adolescence. Children do not have executive function or very reduced executive function. Executive function emerges in adolescence and even then it is very primitive and very basic. Executive function in its fullest form starts after age 25 and, or 30. Consequently, in adolescence, there is a huge activity of emotions. Emotions are very powerful and there is no executive to control them. The areas in the brain that control emotions, control impulses, are very primitive in adolescence. So adolescents are driven by very strong emotions and very strong cognitions also, but they are out of control because there's nothing in the brain that helps them to execute, helps them to manage. There's no management system. This management system in adults is known as executive function and it includes adaptation. As the environment changes, the executive system dictates a change in behavior. So the environment changes and the individual reacts by changing his or her behavior. Self-regulation, that means control, we will talk about it a bit later, essentially self-control. And self-efficaciousness or self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the ability to obtain or to extract beneficial, favorable outcomes from the environment. The environment could be human environment, other people. The environment could be non-human environment. But to get best outcomes, best consequences, best results from the environment is called self-efficacy. Adolescents don't have, don't have this. Adolescents are much less adaptive than adults. They're very rigid. And so when an adolescent is frustrated, or when an adolescent comes across adverse circumstances, or when an adolescent is rejected or disappointed, the adolescent loses it. There's no adaptation. Adolescent, the self-regulation of adolescence is very reduced. We'll discuss it in a minute. And adolescents are not actually very self-efficacious. In other words, they're not so good at manipulating or shaping the environment to obtain the best outcomes. They're not so good at it. They are more passive, they're more reactive. They react to the environment. They don't try so much to shape it. So this is executive function. Next, regulation. Healthy, normal people, especially adults, but not adolescents so much, Adults have something called self-regulation. Self-regulation simply is when you have emotions, when you have moods, you're up or down, when you have impulses, you want to do something very strongly, you control it, you're in control. Impulse control, emotional regulation, mood stabilization. Mood lability is when you cannot stabilize the mood. Mood lability, when you cannot stabilize. Emotional dysregulation is when you cannot regulate the emotions. And in lack of impulse control is when you cannot control your impulses, your drives, your urges. You want to do something, you have to do it, you do it, that's it. You don't care. So self-regulation is a sign of healthy, healthy maturation and development and a major feature of adulthood. 
The healthy adult full, is fully in control of his or her emotions, moods, and impulses. This regulation is the opposite of self-regulation. This regulation is when you cannot control impulses, moods, and emotions, they control you. So when you have an emotion, you're overwhelmed. The emotion overwhelms you, it drowns you. You cannot cope with the emotion, it's too strong. You know, you see a sad movie, you fall apart, you cry. <laughs> the emotions overwhelm you. This is emotional dysregulation. Or moods, moods, you're up and down, you're depressed, you're euphoric, you're this, you're that, and you cannot control it. it it's internal and you cannot control it. Impulses, you want to do something, you do it, you don't care about the consequences, you don't care about other people, you just have to do it and that's it, you must do it. So this is dysregulation. The most extreme form of dysregulation is in a mental health disorder known as borderline personality disorder. People with borderline personality disorder, they have, they have emotional dysregulation. Actually, emotional dysregulation in borderline personality disorder is so bad that in big parts of the world, it's not called borderline personality disorder, it's called emotional dysregulation disorder. It's because the emotional dysregulation is really, really bad in borderline. The borderline is, falls apart whenever she experiences positive and negative emotion. Whenever she experiences love, she falls apart. Whenever she ex experiences rejection, hurt, she's hurt, she falls apart. She cannot control her emotions, they control her. Impulses, the most extreme form of lack of impulse control is the psychopath. Psychopaths have no impulse control. The psychopath wants sex, wants money, wants something, he will get it now. He doesn't care who is hurting, what happens around. If the police is there, he doesn't give, he doesn't give you know, a fig. He goes for it. He's goal-oriented. It's like a machine. So there's no impulse control in psychopathy. This regulation can happen for many reasons. For example, in borderline personality disorder, there is dysregulation when the borderline is rejected, when the borderline is abandoned. She goes into emotional dysregulation. Um, in other cases, when there are many demands, even healthy people can go into dysregulation if they are in a crisis, under enormous stress. So the outside environment generates internal dysregulation. It's a reaction to, the, to a very difficult environment. And finally, there's something called external regulation. People who are habitually dysregulated, people who are dysregulated all the time, people who are dysregulated all the time, like borderlines, like narcissists, what they do, they use other people to regulate them. So the borderline, for example, the borderline is overwhelmed by her emotions. Her emotions destroy her from inside. She's falling apart, she's crying, she's screaming, she's, she can't control it. I'm saying she because historically most borderlines were women. Today, half of all borderlines are men, so don't make a mistake. And so the borderline is incapable of coping with her emotions. What she does, she finds an intimate partner. She finds a boyfriend or he finds a girlfriend. And the boyfriend or the girlfriend regulate the emotions. They regulate the moods. These people are using other people to regulate themselves. So, for example, if there's a borderline and she has a boyfriend and he tells her, wow, you're so beautiful today, you're amazing. I mean, she's in the sky. She is, you know, her mood is effusive and, and so on and so forth. But of course, if he tells her you're ugly today, he has the opposite effect. The regulation comes from the outside. This is called external regulation. Narcissists do the same. Narcissists don't have a stable sense of self-worth. In other words, narcissists don't have a stable self-esteem. The self-esteem of the narcissist depends on feedback from other people. Other people need to tell the narcissist, you're a genius, you're gorgeous, you're this, and then the narcissist takes this attention, takes this narcissistic supply, and regulates his sense of self-worth, self-confidence, and self-esteem. It's an example of external regulation. OK? 
Okay? Again, these are also the stages in human development. Babies, babies and children up to age nine plus cannot regulate. They rely on external regulation. They don't regulate from the inside. Then around the age of two years old and around the age of 12 to 15, there are periods of dysregulation. Two years old, they throw temper tantrums, they break toys, etc., etc. This is known as the terrible twos. And similarly, adolescents, especially in early adolescence, 12 to 15, 12 to 16, they are internally dysregulated and it shows in their behavior or in their reactions and so on. So this regulation is common in these periods. Self-regulation appears only in adulthood. Again, we have a situation here where concepts in psychology apply differently to different parts and phases of life. So it is wrong to study psychology. There's no such thing. There is psychology of children, psychology of adolescents, and psychology of adults. There's no such thing as human psychology. <laughs> Simply no such thing. Because the differences are enormous, almost like differences between species. You know? The differences between children and adolescents are much bigger than the differences between men and women. Much, much bigger. So you can imagine. Okay. Inductive versus deductive reasoning. The child and the adolescent. The child and the adolescent. What they do, they collect information. They observe, they study, they read. They collect information. All the time they collect information. They listen to figures of authority like teachers, parents, role models, influential peers, and so on. And they collect information. And then what they do based on this information, they create a theory. They have a lot of information and they create a theory. And this theory guides them. And this is known as inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, as I said, is common to early stages of life. When you become an adult, you transition from inductive reasoning to deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is when you study the theory and the principles and then you apply them to your observations. You don't go from observations to theory, you go from theory to observations. And then the observations prove the theory or falsify the theory. So inductive versus deductive reasoning. Dual process model. Dual process model says that there are two types of thinking, intuitive thinking and analytic thinking. But I think it's wrong. I think we should add critical thinking. I think there are three types of thinking. Intuitive thinking is emotional, essentially. It's like emotional thinking. It's impulsive, it's immediate, it's emotional, it's fast. No critical faculties, it's just, you know it's true when you ask someone with intuitive thinking, why do you think this way? I just know it, I know it's true, that's it. Most grandmothers are like this, okay. Analytic thinking is usually adult thinking. So intuitive thinking is very common in childhood. Hmm. Intuitive thinking is very common in childhood and in adolescence. Analytic thinking is common in adulthood. Analytic th thinking, as the name implies, you analyze data and so on and so forth in order to derive general principles or vice actually vice versa, but there's a connection between principles and data via a process of analysis. Critical thinking is not related to these two. <laughs> That's why I think it should be included. I think it should be three, not two. Critical thinking is the ability to tell apart true from false, true information from false information. How to do that? There's a whole science on how to do that. But it's, it's a third type, because you could be an intuitive thinker and realize that your intuition is wrong. So you could be intuitive critical. You could be analytic critical. So critical thinking is not limited to analytic or intuitive. It's, it applies to all thinking. And this is, well, this is my addition. So 
This is the dual process model. Yeah? And finally, metacognition. Metacognition involves self-awareness. Children are beginning to be self-aware around the age of, well, depends. Very basic self-awareness starts actually very early, a few weeks old. There's basic self-awareness, like self-awareness of the body. This is known as proprioception. But when I talk about self-awareness, I mean self-awareness of who you are, uh, your limitations, your strengths, what you, what you do best, what you don't know how to do, your skills. Um, a well-developed, well-rounded perception of yourself. That's what I mean when I say self-awareness. And this is only, happens only in adulthood. Adolescents are not self-aware. Not in any meaningful sense. They get it wrong most of the time. Their self-awareness is actually grounded in fantasy and not in reality. Children in this sense of full-fledged self-awareness don't exist. They have absolutely no self-awareness. Adolescents have some glimmers of self-awareness, but not fully. So this is self-awareness. Self-awareness is connected to something known as reality testing. Reality testing is the ability to gauge reality appropriately, to realize that this is reality. This is what's happening. And so, this perception of reality and to trust your own judgment of reality, this is known as reality testing. You cannot be self-aware if your reality testing is impaired. If your reality testing is short, it's, it's problematic. You don't appreciate reality properly. You're wrong about reality. You attribute all kinds of elements to the wrong causes and so on and so forth, then definitely you cannot be self-aware. Some people will try to influence your reality testing. Some people, abusers, they will try to influence your reality testing. You will tell them something and they will tell you you're wrong. That's not the way it is. So for example, you have a boyfriend and you have a fight with him and uh, you say to him, during the fight, you called me bad names. And he would say, no way. I never called you bad names. You're completely wrong about it. But wait a minute, I have a recording. Not true. I don't know when this recording is from. I did not call you yesterday any bad names. This kind of person is trying to influence your reality testing. He's trying to make you distrust your reality testing. And this process is known as gaslighting, if you heard of it. Abusers, in abusive relationships, the abuser usually tries to make you doubt your own ability to appreciate reality properly, to make you doubt your own reality testing by insisting on a version of events that has nothing to do with reality. And then the term gaslighting comes from two movies, two movies made in the 40s. And in these two movies, there's this guy and there's this rich woman. So she falls in love with him, he's charming. I could fall in love with him. She falls in love with him and everything. And they, yes? Is that the movie Sissy? Sorry? Is that the movie Sissy? No, no. Gaslight, it's called Gaslight. The mov both movies are called Gaslight. And uh, so they get married. And then he begins, he begins to make her doubt her own reality. He removes, he removes paintings from the wall. And she, come, she wakes up in the morning and says, where's the painting? Don't you remember that you removed it yesterday? He says, no, I, do, I did not remove it yesterday. You did, my dear, you did. Something is really wrong with you. You must see a psychiatrist, you must take medication. And then he steals her jewelry. And she looks for the jewelry and she says to him, where's my jewelry? What happened to my jewelry? And she says, yesterday you wore it. Yesterday you wore the jewelry, and I don't know where you left it. No, I didn't touch this jewelry for six months. Yesterday you wore it. You're very wrong. So he, he makes her doubt. She begins to think that she's crazy, you know? He makes her think that she's crazy. He impairs her reality testing. This is called gaslight. Prioritizing. Part of metacognition 
part of metacognition is to establish priorities. This matters more than this. So I will dedicate my resources to this. Priority number one is more important than priority number six. So I will put my effort, my resources, my time, my investment, my money, I will put it on priority number one, not on priority number six. Now, in many studies and experiments with children, we found out that children and even adolescents, actually, there are a few studies too that I remember with adolescents, cannot prioritize. When they have like option one, two, and three, and four, they will, they will not know what to do, and they will begin to do all four simultaneously. They, they cannot say, okay, I will do one, because one is most important. They try to do all four, and this is prioritizing. Have you heard of the marshmallow, marshmallow experiment? Have you heard of it? No? You haven't heard of the marshmallow experiment? I'm gaslighting you now. Marshmallow experiment is a very famous experiment. You're invited, you're instructed to watch it online. It's very cute. It's like two minutes, three minutes. Marshmallow experiment, there's no link. Go to YouTube and type marshmallow experiment. It's super cute. The marshmallow experiment is this. Uh, there are two kids, but I mean babies, like two, three years old, you know? And they're very cute. They sit in two chairs, you know? And there is this uh, psychologist. This experiment is proof positive that all psychologists are sadists. The psychologist comes into the room and she puts marshmallows. Do you know what these marshmallows? Very tasty, very sweet. She puts marshmallows on the table and she tells these poor babies, she tells them, uh, if you wait a little and you don't eat the marshmallow, I will give you another one. If you eat the marshmallow, you can eat the marshmallow now, but that's it, you will not get another one. But if you wait a little, I will give you another marshmallow and you will have two marshmallows to eat. So then the experiment starts. She leaves the room, it's a she usually. She leaves the room and the babies begin to talk. Babies are two or three years old. Infants, infants, clinically infants. They begin to talk. And so usually the girl, that's a girl and a boy. I'm kidding you not. I mean, watch it online. Usually the girl says, wait a minute, let's wait because we will get another marshmallow. And the boy says, no, no I'm gonna eat marshmallow now. And the boy eats the marshmallow. <laughs> and so this is, this is about something called delayed gratification. The, the boy, not the boy, some of them are girls. It is being done with thousands of children, by the way. So the children who eat the marshmallow immediately, they are children who have no concept of the future. They cannot visualize the future. And they cannot delay gratification. They need to be gratified now. They have no impulse control. So this is an example of prioritizing. They're unable to prioritize. And they're unable to relevance. Relevance is to decide, this is more relevant, this is less relevant. I will focus on the more relevant and I will ignore the less relevant. Yeah? Next is memorizing. This is all metacognition. Metacognition is a very fancy word, very frightening word. It simply means thinking about your own thinking. Thinking about your own thinking. So part of it is memorizing, strategies to memorize things, and deficiencies in memorizing. Inability to grasp strategies of memory, inability to produce them. We'll talk about it in detail a bit later. This in a nutshell, today what we did is I introduced you to the total vocabulary of uh, development theories. So from now on, when we talk about development theories, if you remember this vocabulary, you will not have any difficulty to understand. There are quite a few development theories, and as I said to you, we're gonna start with the scientific ones, and we're gonna end with the literary ones. And all the development theories deal with two basic questions. What happens to us 
from embryo to death. What happens to us from child to adolescent? What happens to us from adolescent to adult? In other words, stages, life stages. And the second question, the developmental uh, theories, lifespan development theories in psychology deal with is are there any commonalities, are there any things that are lifelong, that are stable, that, are, that define us as humans, never mind if we are one year old or 100 year old, is there anything common? Each psychologist has his own answer, that's one thing you're going to discover in psychology, if you have two psychologists you have three opinions, usually. So it's a big problem in psychology. There is disagreement about literally everything, all the time. <laughs> so even here, there's a huge disagreement. I, for example, and you don't have to accept my opinion, definitely. You don't have to accept my opinion, but my opinion is that there are some commonalities, but these commonalities are artificial. I do think that humans develop much more like butterflies. There are stages that are distinct, and it's not clear at all what, how the transitions happen. The, the brain develops, of course, but the brain develops smoothly. The brain doesn't jump. Right? There's a smooth development in the brain, but there is no smooth development in life. And this disconnect between the hardware, the hardware develops smoothly, but in life, we, uh, as children, we are not like adolescents and we are not like adults. We are totally different people. This has not been explained yet. There is no good explanation how this happens. How a child suddenly becomes adolescent. Yes, the body changes, of course. But it's a common mistake to think that the biggest changes in the body are in adolescence. That is not true at all. The biggest changes in the body are between the ages of zero and two actually. So, and between zero and two, there is a continuity, a psychological continuity, no disruption. Everything is the same. So I don't think it's the body that explains these jumps. Why do we jump? Why do we jump from one stage to the next? There is a question of evolution. There is something called evolutionary psychology. And there's a question, is it helpful? as far as evolution, as far as our survival as a species, is it helpful that we jump? Maybe the jumping allows us to better adapt and better respond to the environment. It's a mystery and we're going to try to probe this, this mystery because if we don't find some kind of solution or answer, then what's the point? Because if you read the title of the, the, title of the course, from adolescent to adult. It's a very misleading title. It's a misleading title. It's like it's a, it's a road from Tetovo to Skopje. It's not. It's not. And we need, to, we need to resolve this. And we'll try our best. We'll try to use theories of other people. Maybe we, we will come up with a theory of our own. And future generations will learn about us. Who knows? OK. Thank you for being patient and for surviving. See some of you, I hope, next time. <laughs>